The Disney Empire has made its reputation based on family-friendly entertainment, so I was surprised that Walt Disney was fond of discussing his youthful adventure in a western brothel. It is repeated nearly word for word in several books about his life. When researching this topic, it dovetailed through coincidence and location into how Hollywood itself got started. Walt's older brother Roy had gotten a job on the railroad working for America's first franchise restaurant, the Fred Harvey Company. Fred Harvey's name came up after the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe Railroad's inaugural trip to Pueblo, Colorado. Unfortunately, the train full of distinguished Kansas visitors hit a storm and a cow nearly starved all the guests and left them begging for food at farms en route to Pueblo. Railroads didn't provide food and Fred Harvey soon did more than that. Many claim Harvey civilized the West, but his influence on charting our future great American road trips and travel can't be overstated. It is as if his fast food empire refined the entire mythos of the West. And if this was longer, I could probably do a pretty good job convincing you that Fred Harvey and Walt Disney were very much kindred souls. More than that Fred left this earth in 1901 when Walt entered it. <laughs> Growing up in Marceline, Missouri, Walt's uncle Mike, an operating engineer on the Santa Fe line, which ran between Chicago, past his house, and on to Los Angeles, would toot his horn when passing in code to signal the young boys, and Mike and Walt's father would regale them with railroad stories, his father about building the line into Denver. Unsurprisingly, young Walt would dream too of where the railroad could take him and his own adventures on the open rail. When Walt was 15 years old in 1917, he too got a job on the railroad. Walt's job was slinging newspapers and snacks to passengers as a news butcher boy like Roy. On one such trip, someone mentioned this great hotel which he thought he'd check out. So Walt, upon pulling into Pueblo, Colorado's Union Depot, walked five blocks to this hotel, taking in the scenery. Few people know this today, but Pueblo was where Doc Holliday and Wyatt Earp fled after the OK Corral. Its sheriff protected Doc from extradition back to Arizona and had connections to Butch Cassidy, Bat Masterson was the sheriff, Bob Ford, Kit Carson before. Pueblo had a storied Wild West reputation. Young Walt would have likely heard rumors about such places, as these personalities weren't a generation past. Walt climbed the impressive stairs to the leaded glass doors to enter. The lobby was impressive with red velvet drapes and chandeliers. It had a gold piano. He ordered a beer from the red-headed hostess dressed in green, wondering if he could even afford to stay the night. Over his shoulder, the high-pitched laugh of a woman caused him to turn in his seat just in time to see a fetching darling, just as a cowboy led her down the stairs. Suddenly, in his young mind, he recalls realizing this was, in fact, a brothel. Walt ran all the way back to the depot. So first, let me say I have it on good authority that this was the Hotel Veil vale because of the details of the red velvet upholstery and the gold piano. The Veil vale has had presidents pictured around it and Clark Gable stayed there when he was stationed in Pueblo. It wouldn't be unimaginable that even at the Veil vale there could have been prostitutes operating. Let's take a moment either way to toast Disney's vivid imagination or naivete in reacting so strongly from watching these two people walking down the stairs that it would cause him to run for several blocks. And what, catch a train out of town as quickly as he could? Did this really happen, Walt? Another curious fact about these stories is that Colorado forbade alcohol in January 1916, a year before, getting a jump on prohibition due to no organized effort to oppose the ban. Possibly this was a different, looser establishment on Union Avenue, but the detail of the gold piano and red upholstery seems specific to the Vale. 
Maybe Walt was embellishing that he was served beer. 12 years later, Pretty Boy Floyd would be picked up in Pueblo at 325 Union Avenue trying to start a prostitution ring. But this would hardly scratch the surface of prohibition in Pueblo. An upside to the great 1921 flood in Pueblo would be that all the secret tunnels under Pueblo flooded too and filled with flood debris. Thus, still sit unexcavated like an enormous prohibition era time capsule left for some future generation to dig up by the way these were the first aerial photos by the associated press so walt's parents let him ride the rails at 15 and there he is observing people on his own a fly on the wall and this brief interaction observed from across the room is the story he would repeatedly tell in the books about Walt's life, there are, in fact, other indications he was quite sensitive and maybe too idealistic about relationships when he was younger, hung up on rejections and traumatized by those, quote, horrible color slides, unquote, of venereal diseases they showed him after he'd forged a birth certificate the next year to enlist in the Red Cross during World War I. I was curious about these color slides and how they may have traumatized young Walt and affected his attitudes towards sex. I contacted the National Museum of Health and Medicine to discuss these innovative magic lantern shows that soldiers like Walt would have seen a hundred years ago. The lantern shows acted similarly to later motion pictures for education and entertainment. I won't show anything graphic, but from multiple sources, the military faced a health crisis due to venereal diseases predating World War I because of the lack of education and availability of such things as condoms. The military used guilt, shock, and patriotism to try to stem the tide of infection. Organizations like the YMCA practiced similar education before the war because of the crisis. From my research, it appears as a societal shift or conversation related to these changing attitudes towards prostitution and fear of disease, and it kept emerging the more I researched. Fred Harvey and his Harvey girls are part of the story, as he employed an army of unwed girls in various positions, from waitresses to guides. For the first time, these girls could travel and work off the farm, and it was less morally suspect due to Harvey's efforts to provide a safe working environment. Even the later Harvey Girls film frames the story by pitting the prostitutes in the Western brothel against these girls in Harvey's employment. Undoubtedly, the war materials influence Walt and his generation's views towards sex. Don't let the wish grow cold. Oh, I feel strange. Her breath will still. All this likely provides some context for his later creation of idealized Disney princesses and in retelling such tales as Snow White, his first feature-length film. Walt had watched the silent version of Snow White the same year he worked as a news butcher on the railroad and this trip to the Vale. There's a thing I remembered as a kid. Uh, Snow White is probably one of my first big feature pictures I'd ever seen. Anyway, to me, I thought it was a perfect story. He'd even come up with the idea of retelling it himself, in fact, also in 1917. And to come back to the studio where he related by himself the whole Snow White story. He acted all the parts, he had the characters. Everything in this Snow White picture was completely developed in his own mind. He's bashful. He's secretly in love with Snow White. Snow White has a beauty that is obvious to her. She's very humble about it. She's not overtly sexual. This is an ideal 1930s woman. Filmmakers went west because Thomas Edison attempted to monopolize motion pictures through patents, expensive litigation, controlling distribution, and even direct violence. The Edison Trust even tried to censor their competition's films by decrying the need for 
moral purification of movies and citing prostitution as requiring their censorship board's control to oversee. There was a whole exploitation genre of films starting in 1912 based on stories that dealt with sexually transmitted diseases. These were conversations important in America at the time. The Paramount Corporation had resulted from a merger and made this version of Snow White. The Paramount logo of the mountain was originally a recollection of Pikes Peak scribbled on a napkin by its founder, Hodgkinson in New York after recalling his time working as a telegraph operator at, coincidentally, the Union Depot. Stranger still, when this merger was finally completed in 1917, it brought with it Jesse L. Latsky Feature Play Company and Cecil B. DeMille's directorial debut, the first feature shot in Hollywood, 1914's The Squaw Man, into the Paramount fold. The story goes, DeMille was on the Santa Fe line between Chicago and Los Angeles, and when the weather didn't pan out in Flagstaff, they continued on to the end of the line in Los Angeles, which was still very rural. DeMille, Flagstaff, no good for our purpose, have proceeded to California, want authority to rent barn in a place called Hollywood for 75 a month. Goldwyn's response, Authorize you to rent barn on month-to-month basis, don't make any long commitment. The barn, of course, became Hollywood's first studio and is now the Hollywood Heritage Museum. Would it surprise you at this point <laughs> that one of the Squaw Man stars was also from Pueblo? The four-year-old Carmen de Rue, this was the first of 200 films to her credit. Her father, Eugene, also born in Pueblo, had accompanied her and had a walk-on in The Squaw Man. Later, he became a director himself and would pioneer dubbing for sound design and in foreign languages, allowing for Hollywood foreign releases. It appears the de Rues were Italians named Chiarione, and possibly de Rue was easier to credit. Eugene also acted as assistant director to Frank Capra in his early silence and saved him from being fired early in his career by Harry Cohen. Later, Eugene would even act as Capra and Cohen's go-between with Mussolini. Il Duce tried to hire Frank to make a film about his life in 1935, which Mussolini wanted to write personally. Cohen and Frank decided against the idea. <laughs> Walt, looking for better prospects like DeMille, would eventually ride the Santa Fe line to its terminus in Los Angeles. But what surprised me most about Walt's childhood was that he'd practiced drawing by copying covers of his mother's appeal to reason. This left-wing political newspaper started after Pueblo and Julius Whalen completely converted his political beliefs after a long conversation with an Italian cobbler over a strike in Pueblo. So much was Whalen's influence that Mother Jones called Whalen her inspiration, and he paid Upton Sinclair to write The Jungle, which instigated Theodore Roosevelt to enact the Pure Food and Drug Act, which led to the FDA. All of these activists were in and out of Colorado and making national headlines because of the Ludlow Massacre just a few years before Walt's 1917 trip resulting in the younger Rockefeller being forced to reform his stance towards his workers. Walt would say, I got so I could draw capital and labor pretty good. The big fat capitalist with the money, his foot on the neck of the laboring man. Yet, ironically, Walt's biggest troubles with labor, his refusal to let his animators unionize, and the resulting strike were catalyzed by the success of Snow White. A film about miners. Walt Disney had a complicated relationship with his father, a socialist, and these strikes by the Disney artists drove Walt into a dark place. So much so, Walt kept tabs on those who participated in the strikes and testified without proof before Congress that the organizers were communists. The first people to put me to smear me and put me on the unfair list were all of the commie front organizations. I can't remember them all, they've changed so often, but one that's clear in my mind is the League of Women Voters. Generally, Walt was listless due to the conflict until he rode the Santa Fe line to a train convention and returned obsessed with building a model train in his backyard. 
strange to observers at the time, except for Salvador Dali. Dali thought it was brilliant. This obsession eventually morphed into Disneyland, and then his dream to have people live inside the world of tomorrow at Epcot Center at Disney World, a dream I personally wish he'd realized before he died in 1966. 1966 was a different world. <laughs> in fact, remember Eugene Duru? Jim Morrison would buy Eugene's L.A. Laurel Canyon house after The Doors became the house band at the Whiskey Go-Go this same year. I will end by saying that Walt Disney hired an Italian from Pueblo, Carl Bongiorno, before he died. Carl would lead Disney Imagineers to create attractions such as Epcot Center and Tokyo Disneyland, the Disney MGM Studios theme park, and Disneyland Paris. Beyond Pueblo or the Italians, the lands of the Great American Desert, which were connected first by animal trails, then foot trails, and then rails, mother highways like Route 66, have exerted influence well beyond their tiny, dispersed populations on our imaginations. How did all these familiar associations happen in such an unfamiliar place as Pueblo? I recommend watching PBS's episodes of American Experience on Walt Disney, but as you're watching, consider their discussion of Marceline, Missouri and Disneyland's Main Street, USA in a broader context. Missouri is technically more of a departure point for the Great American Desert, such as for the Santa Fe Trail or Railroad, but because of this, it's deeply connected. You would have to live in an expansive and prominent metropolis to interweave such famous personalities or connections around a single location. I like New York City, but statistically today, there are almost 30,000 people per square mile in New York City versus 24 people per square mile in the one third of the US land that makes up the desert. The rest of the United States has a disproportionate advantage in doing important things. Yet our country's most scarcely populated region seems to beat these statistics regularly. As a result, the desert occupies a more prominent role in our American identity than we were often aware. And I'll explore this in future videos. Please subscribe to join me as I try to catch just a few of the stories tumbling along through the great American desert.